Hi there, welcome to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. And as you can see, we are going to talk about the Spirit of Truth today. And I must just forewarn you before we go into this message that um, this is not going to be an easy message to hear. And um, by extension, not an easy message to give. But this message has really been burning in my heart for the past week or so. You know, very often Father gives me a, a more or less an idea of the next devotional, even whilst I'm busy with the previous one. So this has been brooding in my spirit for quite a while. And what he does then during the course of the time of opening this up to me, he just speaks through absolutely everything um, to me um, in various ways, you know. I've come to realize this morning as I thought about just these ways with me, how he teaches me, I've realized he's never silent. Um, he's always talking and even in his silence, he's very loud. <laughs> so um, I just pray that Father will absolutely have his way in our heart um, as we listen to this. You know, I have a, a great responsibility when I speak what he gives upon my heart to be this which I speak because it has to come from a place of authenticity and you will maybe remember in my very first introduction video of this channel I spoke about the word authenticity and I said that I will probably use this word a lot and in essence this is what this teaching is about is about authenticity what it means to be authentic and how God goes about it to make us that very thing. So this, I woke up this morning just thinking, you know, this word has been such a burden on my heart. When he gives me something to share and to teach upon, it really becomes a burden in my heart. And the moment that I've uh, released it, the moment I've spoken about it, um, done, done the teaching, um, that burden is lifted from me and I, I want the burden lifted <laughs> um, because it's not easy. Um, you know, I've just found myself numerous times so emotional by the things that it's shown me. Um, it's almost as if he amplified, um, given me uh, the ability to see deception, whereas normally... You know, it's easily to overlook. So I just want to pray before we start with this devotional teaching. And I pray that you will enter into the spirit of humility. You know, um, humility makes us pliable to receive the engrafted word of God. You know, a, a, a heart that is the ground that has been toiled receives a seed and you know just to have that humility to say lord what whatever needs to be said and sown into my heart let it just come into a heart readily to receive that which is of you father thank you for this opportunity immense privilege to be able to speak to your children your lambs your sheep father a huge privilege and a huge responsibility, Father. It's with fear and trembling, Father, that I come to speak, Father. And I pray that you will anoint these clay lips so that it won't be me speaking, but you speaking through me. And I just give myself completely over to you to come and have your way. Holy Spirit, that you will come and speak the truth that we need to hear even in my own speaking, that it will minister to me, Father. I just surrender my heart wholly, completely unto you, that you will come with your two-edged sword, that you will come and pierce between bone and marrow, that you will divide between soul and spirit, and that you will discern the intents and motives of our heart, and that we just come humbly to you, and say, Lord, come, we open ourselves up to you to come and show us and lift the veil of our understanding that we may enter and be truth, authenticity. Just thank you for that, Father. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. 
Amen. You know, not so long ago, I woke up, I think it was the 7th of April, I woke up with the words in my spirit. Something Father often does, wake me up and then there's just something he drops in my spirit. And the words that he said was, a true Christian or a Christian is someone who does not take the easy way out. Quite a way to wake up. <laughs> and I didn't know why he was saying that to me until I remembered that that very same evening I woke up, I think it's 25 minutes past two, so that's two to five. I looked it up in the Strong's Concordance and it means truth. Still wasn't sure where he was going with it, but all of this is actually just birthed out of that small beginning. And you know, Father speaks to me in so many various ways through people's dreams. Maybe somebody wants me to interpret a dream for them. Then it might not have any bearing at that moment to me, but later on it will, even though it's got nothing to do with me. Or somebody, I will hear something in passing, or I will see something, or somebody will do something. All these collectively, he speaks to me, and then he starts building a message, and finally it forms a picture. So this is just one example of how he just drops something in my spirit. And you know, he desires of us to have a learned ear to be able to live from every word that he speaks to us. This is what Yeshua requires of us when he says that we walk by the Spirit. You know, he said that man shall not live from bread alone. That is a reference to the manna, which is a reference to the written word of God. He says, but man shall live from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So that very word, Peter said, where can we go in John 6? For only you have the words of life, like I mentioned in my previous devotional. Those words of life are what we are to live from as he speaks through us. The words that we speak must be life. And speaking those words comes out of the abundance of our heart, right? So that means his very words are not just a life to the hearer, but it's a life to the speaker. And Proverbs 10, 11 says that the mouth of the righteous is a well of life. So we live from every word that he speaks to us. Those words are not just hearing but it's the ability to discern when he speaks through whatever means just like i described now whether a picture or somebody saying something or whether somebody does something he is speaking and he wants us to live by the spirit that is how you live by the spirit by every word that he speaks to you through these various means and so he needs to train us up in that we want to be sensitive to that. In Isaiah 50, let's go to Isaiah 50. He speaks about this hearing ear. He says his, his ways are not our ways. He doesn't think like we do. That says a lot. <laughs> um... Let me see, where is that scripture? I clothe, verse 3, I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He woke me up in the morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. So I have a learned ear. He develops that ear by helping us to discern when he speaks to us. Um, I think it's Proverbs 20, 31, I'm not certain about that, but 
where he says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. So your ability to hear and see and perceive has everything to do with your heart. So as our heart is given over to him, as he purifies it, it clarifies our ability to hear and see and perceive. Okay, so that is how you live by the Spirit. It's knowing the Word of God, but it's out of a pure heart, which opens our spiritual eyes and ears. Okay, so he gives us a learned ear and ability to see. So he wakes me up with these words, which sounds very confrontational in a way, if you think of it, which is saying that a Christian is someone who does not do things the easy way. They don't look for the easy way out, right? And this makes me think of, of how we are prone to cut the corners when it comes to things that makes us uncomfortable. You know, a Christian is somebody that is willing to pay the price, whatever that price may be. And um, I laughed the other day because my husband took me out for, for dinner and we drove past a, uh, a restaurant and the restaurant's name, or the restaurant was completely uh, painted black and on the outside and it had, the name on it was called Black Sheep. And my husband, very tongue-in-cheek, said to me, Oh, there's a restaurant for you. <laughs> Saying, you know, I'm, I'm the proverbial black sheep in my family. And um, the other day, he also said to me, he said, he was, I know he was saying it in concern, but he was saying to me that I must be careful about the things that I say on YouTube, or anywhere for that matter, um, because, you know, people might think I'm, I'm crazy or I, you know, they, they, they will turn against me. And my reply to him was, so? <laughs> yes. And he said, no, you, you can't do that. I said to him, well, I'm a salmon. I go against the flow. Now, that is not to be antagonistic. That is showing the type of spirit that he requires of us that is against the flow not because you think you're better not because you think uh, you know it all not because you want to be antagonistic but because you live by every word that he speaks and if that means you go against the flow then so be it it's very similar to uh, to King Ahab that came to, he, he was looking everywhere for Elijah and Elijah came before him and he, he looked to Elijah and he said, are you he who troubles Israel? <laughs> are you the one that upsets the apple cart? <laughs> yes, yes. A Christian is one who does not take the easy way out. Okay, and in order to become that type of Christian, he has to sharpen us, he has to mold us, and he has to take everything away in us that will cause us not to speak the word in season that is necessary to be spoken. Um, the word says that, the Lord's word is refined as silver seven times it's refined. His word that has to come through us has to be refined. And the way it's refined is with from out of our heart. The heart has to be pure. Therefore, the word that comes out of it is pure. Now think of that. Just because I can quote a scripture with every dot and tittle to it, doesn't make that pure. Now you can, might think, Petra, now you're taking things too far. No. It's when the, the heart defiles the word. When you can say something that is truthful or true, but because your heart is insincere, it defiles that word. And it will lack the cogency and the power that needs to come with it. 
This is why the Lord said, guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life. This is why the Lord God said, or Yeshua said to his disciples, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you, but it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. What is in your heart defiles what comes out of your mouth, even if you're good at quoting scripture. Even if you're saying something very nice. Whatever is in your heart defiles that which comes out of your mouth and ultimately defiles you. Because the more you speak untruthfully, meaning not out of a place of sincerity and that being what you speak true, truly true in your heart, the more leaven is introduced into your heart. The more you will be the one to say things that are not true, but have the appearance of truth. And therefore, you will be living a lie. You will be speaking a lie. That is the type of guile he wants to remove from our heart, so that the words that we speak will have power and authority, because ultimately the spirit by which we live is the spirit of truth. Okay. Okay. You know, we know that the time that we are going in, that Yeshua said that the queen of the south is a representation of the bride, will rise with the men of Nineveh, that is a representation of the Gentile church, because they come from all over, they were Gentiles, will rise with the men of Nineveh and judge this generation. It was a prophetic statement of this generation that we are going in. So the bride, the workers, they will be in a place of judgment, meaning they will speak a judgment over this world to convict this world of sin, right? Now, in Isaiah 11, we find a description of Yeshua and how he judges. So let's go there, Isaiah 11. Let's read from verse 1. <clears throat> and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Now, a rod is for correction, right? <clears throat> and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. In truth or in whole, the spirit of truth will rest upon him. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. That sounds almost contradictory, but what it basically means is he's not going to discern or judge people by what he sees or hears. Why? Because the word tells us that he does not look at the outer, he looks at the heart. He wants us to know that the spirit, the sword of the spirit, which is the spirit of truth, discerns the intents and motives of the heart. So you might hear something that's doctrinally correct or you might hear something that sounds sweet and concerning. But if you do not have an ear of, of the learned to discern, you will go on what you see and hear and not be able to discern by the spirit the true intents and motive of the heart. See, so that's very important. This form. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. So he will judge righteously. And Yeshua told us that when we judge, we are to judge righteously. A lot of people say that we shouldn't judge. 
you know, thou shalt not judge. At the same time, Yeshua also said to us, when you judge, judge righteously. So the whole idea is don't be so quick to judge on what you see or hear unless you yourself have taken out the, the, the beam in your own eyes in order that you may judge righteously. You cannot judge righteous, righteously unless you have dealt with what's in your own heart first. It becomes righteous judgment when the words that you speak in judgment are pure. Then it is righteous because God approves of that judgment then. Because you have judged by, been judged by it yourself. Okay. Um, let's go to Luke 6 where Yeshua talks about this judgment. Luke 6 verse 39. And he spake a parable, a parable. He spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Can you judge when you when you yourself haven't been judged yet? Can the blind, when your eyes haven't been opened yet? lead the blind shall they not both fall into the ditch the disciple is not above his master but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye like a small little speck but perceiveth not the beam that is in thy own eye either how canst thou say to thy brother, brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thy eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thy own eye. Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thy own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. You will only see clearly once you've dealt with your own beam in your eye. For a good tree bringeth forth, for a good tree bringeth not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart bringeth forth that which is good in other words when you judge because this is talking about judgment when you judge you will bring forth good fruit proverbs tells us that you will eat the fruit of your mouth so a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So remember, he's talking about judgment here. So he requires of us that when we judge, that it has to be righteous judgment. This is what the workers will do. Part of it is that they will judge. They won't walk around and point the finger the whole time, but they themselves will be a standard. That's the important part, is that they will be a standard. Not just by what they say, but who they are, how they live. They will not take the easy way out. Okay, so a while back I had a vision um, of a man lying on the, on the ground. And it was from far, so all of a sudden, I, he was just lying straight on the ground. And I saw that his mouth was open. And all of a sudden, the vision just brought me closer to his mouth. And I could see with his mouth open that it had tiny white pebbles in his mouth. Completely full. And that was the end of the vision. So what the vision meant was basically that of humility, the man lying down. That we are to humble ourselves. And it's only from that place of humility that we can speak a judgment where our mouth can be full of judgment. 
because those pebbles talks about throwing a stone. In uh, John 8, we hear of, or we read of the, the adulterous woman who was brought by the Pharisees to stand before Yeshua, and they were all ready to stone her. So the little stones or pebbles speaks about judgment. And Yeshua said that he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And of course, Yeshua could have uh, uh, stoned her because he is the one, the only one without sin that could have stoned her. That makes it very interesting. So if he is the only one that can judge, right, why is he telling us to judge righteously? Because he has to first bring us into that place where we can judge righteously. It's not that he's saying don't judge. He's saying judge righteously. And unless you can say I do not have that sin in me, you better be, be quiet and not speak. That's the only time you cannot judge when you are guilty of the same sin. Okay. So we need to understand that we cannot overlook people's sins by under the um, under the the erroneous erroneous thinking of I'm not allowed to judge because nobody is perfect. No, that is uh, that is a cop out. A cop out to justify you in your own compromise because you do not want to be seen as a person that upsets the apple cart you do not want to be seen as a person who judges you do not want to hurt people's feelings that's when you use the words oh you're not allowed to judge and that affirms you in your own compromise. So on the uh, the 5th of April, my mom sent me a, a little video clip of somebody that took pebbles and they made like a, a little picture of a little child sitting with a, a mother and it's all these little stones. And um, later on it became the, the crucifixion and then it became the tomb that was empty and it's such a beautiful little video about these pebbles being placed together and the whole story that it forms and you know when I finished watching it the spirit came over me and I started crying and I say Lord because the the, the video ended with the words even the rocks will cry out and you know my name is Petra and my name comes from the the name Peter which means little stone or rock and I cried because out of my spirit came the words, Lord, let it never be said to me that I've kept quiet about me. Let it never be said about me that I've kept quiet. Let this rock, let this stone cry out. And you know, this, this, the, it's all about the truth. It's, it's, it's all about walking by the spirit, which is walking by the truth which means it requires us to speak out in season. There's a time for everything, but it requires us to speak out. And my cry was, Lord, let me not be silent. Let me not be silent because I fear what people will say. Let me not be silent because I fear rejection. Let me not be silent because I actually fear what I will lose out of this. Let me cry out. Even if I'm the only person crying out, let me cry out the truth. Okay, so let's go to, um, I want to go to Luke 12. Um, and we're going to read that scripture now. Um it's a lengthy one. It's from verse 49 to 59. And this falls in line with what Yeshua was talking to his disciples with regards to um, the discourse, what we will be able, uh, what, will, what we will see. Um, and he's very clear on his purposes. So that's in Luke 12. So let's go there. Verse 
verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? He's saying it's already burning within me. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am straightened till it be accomplished. He's saying, I need to go to the cross. Uh, it's a fire within me and I have to go. No matter what the price is, there's this fire in me, this zeal to get to the cross that the will of my father will be accomplished. It's burning in me to do it. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, I tell you, nay, but rather division. Now that division is G1266, and it means to cleave asunder and to cut into pieces. So he's saying, I don't come to bring union here. Yeah? I've come to bring division. Now, in the previous devotional, The Futility of Man, I spoke about how the time that we are entering in is a time where there's no longer such a thing as fence sitting. You are now entering into a time where you are either for him or against him. There's no gray areas anymore. And it's going to require of us to make a choice whether we choose this world, where we choose the things of this world, whether we choose the general flow where everybody goes in, even our Christian brothers and sisters, or whether we'll go with him. There will be no more gray areas. The world is going to start to persecute Christians progressively more and more and more. And when that time comes and you have not dealt with these things, you will struggle. So he says, he's come to bring division. Verse 52, let's, show, let's see where he brings this division. He's very specific in where he brings it. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And he said also to the people, When ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, There cometh a shower, and so it is. And when ye see the south wind blow, ye say, There will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? How is it that you cannot at this moment see what is happening now on this earth? How is it that you are blind to the division that it's supposed to cause within your family, within your own household? How come you're so eager to protect the unity when he said, I have come to bring division. This is a hard word to hear. Because what happens is we would rather want to protect the bond of peace, but at the expense of truth. Therefore, truth or peace without truth is not peace, just like love without truth is not love. Truth is the foundation. The church, the word says, the church is the foundation and pillar of truth. That means everything, everything about the church is built on the foundation of truth. And that is the whole truth and not partial truth. Because partial truth is a lie. Okay. He says, why can't you discern? 
Why can't you discern the time we are in? Why can't you discern what this will require of you? You can look at the sky. You can look at all the other signs. But you fail to see within your very own household the signs and times. You want to protect yourself from that. But in protecting yourself from that, you are denying the truth. And I am the truth. This is a hard word to hear. Are you denying the truth? Verse 58. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate. Remember he told them. They, your adversaries, your enemies, those of your own household will think they are doing God a service and they will bring you before magistrates. Now he's talking about them that will do it of your own household. We will be stunned. Overwhelmed by what our own family members will do. When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, even on the way there, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee. Make sure you are innocent. Make sure that he has nothing that he can hold against you. That you have done nothing wrong. So that you can stand like Yeshua before Pontius Pilate and say nothing. You don't have to defend yourself because you did nothing wrong. And Yeshua said that in that moment the spirit which he will give us will give us the unction and the words to speak. So there won't be any defending of yourself. You do not feature there. It will be a word that you speak out of a heart that has a clear conscience. Okay. Verse 59. I tell thee thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. So it's clear that the division that he wants to bring is within the house. Our own household even within the house of the church, the church itself. Um, you know, somebody just recently, actually just today, asked me to give an interpretation of a dream, and it was about a boiling pot within a house. Um, and the interpretation was that, that people will come against this family as like a boiling pot, and that that house that they were in represented the church the 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 hatred and vehemence and envy and murderous spirit that will be prevalent in the time to come will be as a boiling pot against those who do not take the easy way out who will speak the truth no matter what even if it meant their life who is sufficient to be able to do this unless they allow the Lord God to deal with their own heart first? I had a dream not so long ago. Um, it was probably two years ago, maybe three years ago. Let's go with two years. And in this dream, I was with my brother and sister in a shop and we were buying uh, ice cream. So we were looking through the different containers or fridges that had these ice creams in. And I saw them, my brother and sister, next to me and they were busy in a cupboard. But they looked very secretive in what they were doing and they had a blowtorch with them. And I saw them lighting something in the cupboard and it caught fire and the next moment they ran out away from me and left me there. I just saw them running away and I'm running after them, you know, surprised at what they were doing. And the next moment the, the shop owner was next to me and he grabbed me and he blamed me for what happened there. And the next moment the scene of the dream changed where I was now 
what it seemed like a, a, a like a shelter or an undercover or a, a, a place of protection where all the Christians were together. And it, as they were together, they each one had an opportunity to testify of something. They had to speak of whatever <clears throat> they've been going through. And there was a person next to me crying and the person speaking was crying and they were crying about their persecution. They were very sad. And in this dream, this person next to me looked to me and I said to him, so you think it's my turn to speak next? And he said, yes. And I said to him, well, you have a thing coming. If you think I'm going to participate in this kind of testimony where you feel sorry for yourself for the persecution that you are going through. This is my dream. And I start speaking out of John 16, right? And I say the following words. Let me read this first. John 16, verse, uh, I think it's from verse 1. And then another part of in it as well. Let's read what it says there. So this dream, basically my brother and sister, represents those within the church and within our families. Okay, because it's brother and sister in the church, in the family. The, the blowtorch that they use to, in the cupboard to secretly do something is that of doing something behind closed doors against others. So it is talking about someone else behind closed doors, but it also is a type and shadow of gaslighting. Okay, and then to set true Christians up to be shown as guilty of things right i was now seen as the one that uh, lit something in the in the shop and then the next part is about the persecution that comes because of that but our disposition that we need to have so they were feeling sorry for themselves the christians that were in hiding and um, bemoaning it so that's obviously not encouraging to the other christians themselves not according to the example we find in the word of god so Yeshua says in John, in John 16, verse 1, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. Okay? Apparently, offense is a big thing during this time. I'm saying that sarcastically. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. So I'm saying this in the dream. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. They have not known the truth. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, the time is now, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things are said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Then to verse 13. Also what I said to them. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and he will show it unto you. Okay, so I was in this dream telling them that the Lord told us that we will be persecuted and that we are to expect it. So it's not like some of us will not be persecuted. We will all be persecuted. This is why he says, I think it's in John 14, that he says that the, the, uh, 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 the servant is not greater than the master because if they persecuted the master, they will also persecute you. Right, and if you look at the the uh, John fourteen up to John seventeen, you will note that it is all one conversation. And in John fourteen, he tells us that we are given the Spirit. It's good that he that that Yeshua says it's good that he leaves so that the Spirit may come. You see, Yeshua was outside of them, but when the Spirit comes, the Spirit comes into our body, right? And collectively, the Spirit of God is in all the people, all bodies, forming one body in Christ 
a voice all over the world speaking the truth. That's why it was expedient for Yeshua to go. Because he was just one person. But when the spirit comes, the spirit of truth in everybody speaking the truth, nobody will be without excuse. But he told them, please understand this, that you will be persecuted. And evidently, being filled with the spirit of truth comes with being persecuted. I will never forget when I once told the Lord, I said to him, Lord, it's going so well with me. Why am I not persecuted? That's the type of dangerous questions I ask him. Because I want to be the real thing. I have a burning desire to be authentic, to be true. And that comes with a price. You have to ask the relevant questions. And it's not long after that, the persecution came. <laughs> so all the glory to him for what he does. Um, now in Luke 12, I mentioned that the last time in, in, in the previous devotional. In Luke 12 verse 15, um, let's just quickly go there, what it says there. It talks about this, the man is not the sum of what he possesses. 12 is 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. And he was talking about leaven, I think, of the hypocrisy of the, of the Pharisees. Um, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So, you know, I was talking in the futility of man. I was talking about that we are not to depend on what we possess and our own knowledge and understanding of scripture, even our own experiences. However, these things have been used in our lives. In the end, we are not to fall back on them. We are only to be led and guided by the spirit. And the spirit reminds of us the things that we need to speak. Okay, so we are not the sum of what we possess. And one of the pearls of wisdom that Father gave me is the thing that he said to me is he said to me, possess nothing. Possess nothing in your heart but me. I want your whole heart. So to bring a better understanding of what he said to me there, I want to let us go to uh, 1 Corinthians 7. And this is where Paul starts speaking to the uh, Corinthians about marriage. And he's saying to them, listen, this is not a law. This is not a commandment. This is how I see it. But I'm saying this to your prophet that it is better for you not to marry because he wanted them to understand that once you marry, you have responsibilities. It's not against the law. It's not God's will. Uh, against God's will that people marry, but he's saying it is better if you don't. If you want to be all for the kingdom of God, then then if Father guides you in this way, then this it is better. That's why many um, missionaries are not married, because they're given completely over um, without distractions. So let's go to that scripture it's in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 29. Let's read from there. Uh, he's talking about the time we are in, okay? But this I say, brethren, the time is short, it remaineth, that both they that have wives be as though they had none. So he says, be like someone who's, be, if you're married, but be as someone who isn't married. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoiceth not. And they that buy as though they possessed not. As they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that he longed to do for the Lord. How may he please the Lord? So a person that's unmarried thinks constantly, how may I please the Lord? It's not that the person that is married don't think that. But they can't constantly think that because of their responsibilities and the things they need to do. 
But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay. So, he's saying here to them that even though you are married, I want you to be able to live in such a way that being married does not take away that which God wants to do in you and through you. Now, how is that accomplished? I mean, this is actually, in a way, a mystery. Now, to understand this, we need to go to what Yeshua said about marriage as well. And that's in Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 11. So the disciples asked him whether there's going to be marriage in heaven. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive the saying, save they to whom it is given. So even now, I'm saying this now to you. Not everybody who hears what I'm going to read now can receive it. Unless God opens this up to you and you understand it. He reveals it is given to you. It's a mystery. Okay. This is a mystery he had to bring me into in order to understand it. So you can understand it theologically, but you need to live it in reality. Those are two very different things. Okay. Verse 12. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb. And there are some eunuchs, which were made eunuchs of men. So the first one is a eunuch born that way. Okay, what is a eunuch? For those who do not know, those are men who are castrated. They can no longer produce out of themselves. They cannot have any offspring. So this, in a spiritual sense, would imply those who no longer depend on the flesh. So now he's saying, saying in the physical, there are those who are born eunuchs. Then there are those who are made eunuchs by men. The eunuchs is an example. With Esther was brought a eunuch had to prepare her for the king. Okay. So he was, and the reason why, a eunuch was given to prepare the brides because the eunuchs would not, then not uh, fornicate with the brides given to the kings. And they were also entrusted with the treasures of the king. You find another example of a eunuch in Acts 7. I'm not sure. I think it's Acts 7. Uh, where Philip met up with the eunuch. And it says that he was a eunuch from Ethiopia and he was reading Isaiah 53. Okay, and he was a great man and he was in charge of the queen's treasures. So I have great responsibility. Okay, so these are the eunuchs that are made by men. But then Yeshua says, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. So a eunuch is obviously not married. Okay. So what this basically means is that unto us is given a choice how far we want to go with the Lord God. How far are you willing to lay everything down? All dependence on the flesh. That also means all dependence on everything outside. The world. People. Friends. Things. Material. Prestige. Uh, knowledge. Everything. How far are you willing to be cut off? And live as a unique. Live married as though you are not married. Having children as though you do not have children. In other words, remember, the context here is possess nothing. 
Now, with this, I want to say, whatever you possess in your heart that you are not willing to let go, be that your husband, your wife, your children, your friends, your ministry, your gifts, your talents, your knowledge, your abilities, whatever you possess in your heart possesses you. You are still owned by it. And if that is the case, you will not bring the sword down to bring that word that will cause division between you and that person. You will not be willing to speak the whole truth. This is the case that we find with parents that are not willing to speak the whole truth to their children because they do not want to lose their children. The children live in disobedience. They are sleeping with their partners. They do things that they want to do the way they want to live. They are in rebellion to them. And so what we do is we sugarcoat what they're doing. We will say, you know, this is not really what the Lord God wants. You, you really shouldn't be doing it. You know, I love you. You know, I, I, I'm not judging you. Uh, you know, you, I just want to say that you know, I don't really agree. That is a slap on the hand. Instead of bringing a word that pierces because it is truth that cuts, we rather go and we pat the hand and go, it's not okay for you to do this. And we move on because after all, we've said what needed to be said. But the reality is we did not say it by the Spirit, and we have not dealt with our own heart first in order to be willing to say it as it needs to be said. Not in vindictiveness, but truth, because truth sets free. Now, when you hear that truth sets free, immediately you have the idea of bondage. You have a chain. Now, what breaks a chain? A hammer, a sword breaks a chain. A key, but that's with a lock. But what breaks a chain? Something heavy. Something has to crush. Something has to cut asunder and divide. And it will happen within the families. Okay. So whatever possesses, whatever you possess, possesses you. And the way it possesses you is because of your, um, the motives of your heart, the desires and lusts of your heart. If you desire that your children will see you as the, as your, as their friend, that you know, just go with the flow, and that you do do not judge them, then that to that degree you are possessed by them or owned by that desire to be loved, to be affirmed, to be approved of. The same goes with your friends. If you are not willing to speak the truth to your friends because you do not want to be seen as the bad guy, the Elijah, the one that will upset the apple cart, if you are not willing to do that, it is because there is still something within your heart that you have not placed on the altar. And so every time you are confronted with having to have to speak the truth and you find yourself holding back even a little bit or not willing to speak it, it is because there is something in your heart that you need to place on the altar. So you come to a point where you place, you say, Lord, I give you my children. How many uh, mothers have not actually said that? Or I give you my husband, or I give you my wife, I place on the altar, you can do with them what you want. But the truth is, your desire to still want to receive approval and love and affection and affirmation and to be considered by that person because you are they are still your source because the axe hasn't been laid to that root you can say 20 times or more that you place them on the altar but you have not yourself brought the axe to the root. For that we go to uh, Exodus 32. Let's go there. Exodus 32 
The Lord speaks to Moses. Um, and he tells them to command the Levites to do something. Exodus 32. Let's see what verse. 26. Twenty six to twenty nine. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Sons of Levi, when you hear Levi, you think priesthood. Okay, priesthood means they've been set apart, they've had blood placed on their ear. Their right ear, their right thumb, and their right toe. That means right. the right-hand side speaks of the side of strength. The blood, the cross has been applied to their strength. They've been weakened. They have died to their own strength. So they are priests. So he says to them, And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. They're choosing a side here. The others didn't. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses has said, Consecrate yourselves day, this day to the Lord. What it means to consecrate is set yourself apart. Apart from your husband. Apart from your wife. Apart from your children. Apart from your friends. Meaning not, don't love them. I, you know, you don't, don't want to have anything to do with them. Doesn't mean that. That means they are no longer your source, so you are free to love them or speak a word of exhortation or correction and reproof because you can, you have set yourself apart. You are married, as, you are uh, 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 married, but you are as though you are not. You have children, but you are as though you are not. You can speak that word to your children because they are not your source of joy, of affirmation, of approval. That's why you can speak that word as one who do not have children, as one who do not have a wife or a husband. Then you can speak it. But unless you have laid the axe to the root of your own heart, and you have dealt with that affirmation that you truly seek from them, and you've laid that on the altar, you cannot be as one. You cannot be that unique then. Because you are not cut off. Can you then speak that word of judgment? Can you then speak a word of truth that is authentic? Because you've judged yourself? No, you cannot. For Moses has said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord, and every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. They had to take their own sword, their own sword, that they were, that they live. I mean, your sword is like uh, the the uh, you when you're in in the army or you're in 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 warfare or whatever. What your weapon is your life. I suppose they say it's your wife. <laughs> you don't forget your wife. <laughs> you don't go without it. It is everything your weapon. You live by that sword in the sense of it's your protection. Everything is done with it. It's the spirit of truth. It's the word of God. You live by that word of God. Every word that he speaks to you. And so with that word that he speaks to you and have judged you by... It is by that word you can judge righteously then. Um, I, my mentor, um, Art Cuts, uh, I, 
opened a book that I haven't read in a while and I saw that I wrote a, a quote that he, he made and it was so applicable to just what Father is showing us. He said, the degree that you are willing to compromise with the truth is the degree that you deny Christ, is the degree that you are unauthentic and fake. The degree that we compromise speaking the truth. Don't lose sight of what this is preparing us for. The persecution that's going to come. Our own households. Okay. You know, in order to speak the truth, we have to be the truth. That's where authenticity comes from. So that truth has to be that red line or golden line that goes right through everything you do in life. You know, Yeshua told the uh, Samaritan woman in John 4 that the time is coming and is now. That those who worship him will worship him in spirit and truth. Worship is not something that you do in a church or just come in your quiet time and put on music and lift up your hands. Worship is your way of life. The word says, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Your life is worship. So whether you minister, whether you worship, whether you clean your house, whether you work all has to be done in spirit and in truth. There can be no lie in you. You know, at work, do you take something that belongs to the work and take it home? Uh, husbands, do you look at women with lust in your heart and forget that it's adultery? Women, wife, do you submit with gritting your teeth? But with a smiley face. That is a lie. That is not submission. It's a start, but it's not submission. He wants truth. The word says in Psalm 51, he desires truth in the inward parts. In the depth of you, he desires truth. Is it truly worship if it's not true? Is it truly ministry if it's not true? Are you truly submitting if it's not true? Are you truly loving your wife when you look at lust on TV, at other women or wherever you are? Is it true when you send an emoji with a smiley face or a heart when you're not really feeling that or that's not really your disposition? Is it true then, just because what you typed in beforehand sounded right? Sounded like what they would want to hear with your little emoji? Is it true? He wants authenticity right through everything we do. And the only way to do that is to walk circumspectly. Is to consider what you do daily. Is to ask him to be so jealous for the truth. You know, this is why this week was so difficult for me. I, I became so jealous for the truth. I love the truth. I love the truth. That's why he's given me eyes to be able to discern when something is not of the truth. It's because I love the truth. It's not knowing the lie that gives us discernment. It's knowing the truth that gives us discernment. And he who is the truth invites us to meet him face to face. That he may show us who we are. In the light of him. 
Because when you stand before him in his truth and you say, Lord, rip up, rip off the band-aid. Show me what's real in my heart. And he comes with his light and he shines into every dark corner of your heart. Are you willing to face it? Then the more you face the truth of your true condition, the more he purifies the words that you will speak. And there will be no fear in your heart. You will be willing to pay the price because you've dealt with these issues. And you know, we will not be willing to pay that price of speaking the truth if it will cause our families to be broken up. If we do not have a kingdom perspective. If we do not have an eternal perspective of everything we say. You know, when you start loving the truth, you start loving words. Words like truth or authenticity or righteousness or holiness starts having weight with you. You start treasuring them. You start using them less. You, you, you start seeing their value and their weight and they do something to your spirit and that starts to make you a peculiar person. You become a strange person then. You don't laugh with everybody else when they laugh. You, you will sit in a service and everybody will be joyful and happy but something in your spirit is agitated. I had that yesterday, last night. Something, your, your, your spirit is somehow in conflict with what you see or hear because you are not perceiving it with the physical eyes and ears. You are perceiving it through the spirit and that makes you a strange individual and it will seclude you and your life will become more lonelier because of it. It's Tozer that wrote a sermon or gave a sermon called The Saint Must Walk Alone. When you are set apart to the truth, it will come with separation. Not everybody is willing for that. I want to read something that Art Katz um, wrote in his book. It's called The book is called The Spirit of Truth. And when I read this, this just nailed it for me. He wrote, To love truth is to, is to desire the guileless transparency of Jesus more than anything else. It needs to be a very powerful desire because along with that transparency comes some things we may very strongly want to escape and refuse. Receiving a love for truth and the spirit who is truth means facing the prospect of life without recourse to exaggeration or white lies or flattery or anything I have grown accustomed to employing in order to enlarge or to protect myself. It means playing no roles, assuming no poses. That frankly frightens most of us. The spirit of truth is going to lead us into all truth. Even the parts that may humiliate us before men. Leave us spiritually uncertain and perplexed. Meaning, did what I say, was that really God? Wasn't I a bit harsh? Was that truly scriptural? And when the Spirit guides you, it even causes you to be in such a place where you think, I can't believe I just said that. Was that really God? And shatter our false images of ourselves, others, and ultimately of God himself. In other words, how you perceive God to be versus how he truly is. That may not be what we were hoping for. We were looking for something more quiet and safe and much less costly. Receiving the love of truth and the spirit 
who leads us unto all truth inevitably means a measure of suffering because disillusionment, uncertainty and humility are all forms of suffering. And suffering is what I desperately want to avoid. I will avoid it at all costs, even at the cost of truth itself, unless I love truth even more than I fear it. It is not ignorance that keeps us from becoming true. It is cowardice. You know, in this week, yesterday, I went for a dentist checkup. And I've had, I've known I've had a, a, a you know, a hole in my tooth here and I've been having so much pain and I've just been uh, setting it off or putting it off for, for quite a while. And then eventually I just realized I needed to go. But all the while I know that Father's already spoken to me about this tooth that is like guile, you know, in your mouth. It affects everything. You know, I, when I brush my teeth, when I drink something hot or cold, or and it's the pain that it causes, it's just always there. Nobody else can see it, but it's there. And he was talking to me about it, you see, because I have to apply everything that I say here to myself, first and foremost. So I knew I was looking forward to going to the dentist, dentist because for me it was like a, a prophetic act of removing it out of my life because I'm praying for this father please remove all guile from my heart and as I went there um, she injected me to deaden it and it wasn't enough then she injected me again and she started boring a hole in it and it was still hurting and the next moment she injected me again. So she had to inject me four times. <laughs> and then she said to me, I'm afraid we have a root canal on our hands here. And so she had to do a root canal. Now, while she was busy, the spirit said to me, this is going to hurt. Wouldn't you love to hear that? <laughs> on a dentist chair. <laughs> this is going to hurt. <laughs> Wonderful. Anyway, so I hear this is going to hurt. And in that moment, I said to the Lord, I would rather let it hurt me now than the alternative of what it means later. And that was his whole purpose because it did hurt. I, I thought I went through the roof. It did hurt. But afterwards, when I spoke to my husband about it, uh, I thought about the fact that it was a root canal. He was telling me, I don't want to just deal with this on the surface level. I want to go to the root of it. And everything, a tree, is the source of a tree, is its roots. And he says, I want to lay the axe to the root of all guile. Guile is everything that is twisted and untrue and, un and unauthentic. I want to lay the axe to the root and clean it up completely in your life. So that when you speak, it is a word that is authentic and with power. And you have to be willing for the pain that it will cause in doing so. You have to be willing to pay the price of all that being removed. From out of your life. I want to um, just read this word that Father gave me, and I'll end it with this. I don't want to make the videos already too long, so I just want to read this the word that He gave me in 2021 on the 30th of uh, September. Abide in me, in my word. And in my love, by keeping my commandments, and your joy will be full. In spite of persecution, you must know that my spirit will guide you in truth. This truth will always separate you 
from this world. This is so that you may be one, undivided, and that I may dwell in you and you may know that we are one. You are one with me and my Father. Therefore, do not expect the world to like you or even your Christian brothers and sisters. Your separated life is an offense to them because of their compromise. Expect this and know that there are others going through the same and the servant is not greater than his master. I went through it because I am not of this world. I was not like them. I was separated, sanctified. I am the truth. Know that to you I send my comforter. He will comfort you and he will speak to you my words. I will never leave you alone. Yeshua said, how can two walk together unless they agree? How can we walk in the spirit and in truth unless we walk in truth? Unless we are truthful about our true condition. Unless we are willing for him to lay the axe to the root. The time we are going in will not be a gray area. And if you are still compromising in these areas, not having dealt with the own issues of your heart in order to speak the truth, and even if it means division, led by the Spirit of God, how will you stand in the time to come and how will you be part of that generation that, or that men of Nineveh that will judge this generation that Yeshua spoke about? How will you be part? He's called us to be separated unto him alone. Not separated in compartments. My heart has this part, my husband in this part, my daughter, this part, my son, this part, my hobby, this part, my ministry. Your heart can't be compartmentalized. Everything is set apart unto him. Therefore, you are whole, holy, sanctified. Nothing is not given up to him. You have given him all your Isaacs. We don't have just one Isaac. We seem to have quite a lot of Isaacs. All your Isaacs have been given to him. He is your only source. David says, all, all my springs are shut up in you. You are my only source of life. Therefore, if anything is taken from me, I will not fall apart. It will hurt, but I will not fall apart. My friends, close friends know I call it an open hand policy. I said everything that pertains to your life, ministry, children, talents, um, even love that you receive from people, affection, approval, everything, everything, your animals, everything must be in your hand open like this. You cannot possess it. It must be open. So he has the right to take anything out of your hand when he wants and how he wants. And he's allowed to put anything into your hand. Be that to slay you, to take from you, to whatever it may be for his glory. He has the right to put also anything into your hand. So if your hand's closed, can he do it? No. Can he take out or put into your hand anything he wants and how he wants? When he wants? When your hand is closed? No. We have to have an open hand policy with regards to our life and those whom we love. If he is not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Father, thank you for the opportunity to minister to your children. 
Father, let this word, which I know has eternal value and consequences, for which we will be held accountable, be taken seriously, Father. Let your word prick our hearts. We humble ourselves before you, Father, and say, Father, we hold nothing back. We don't want to say we surrender all when we haven't. We want to be truthful because you are truth. We want to be jealous for the truth. And I pray, Father, for a jealousy, a love for the truth in everything we do and say. I pray this for those who have ears to hear. Thank you, Father. Amen.